here. Now back to the video. Just like Eater, the Wendelstein 7X project has been in development for decades. More precisely since the 1980s when the planning of the project started. It was only submitted to the European Union in August 1990, followed up by a long bureaucratic period of application assessments concluded March 11, 1996. It would take 19 more years for its first helium plasma test, or the machine's first test run, on December 10, 2015. Eater, on the other hand, still has a long road ahead with its first test run set for 2025 with a current estimated cost of 22 billion euros, but the expected final cost by 2040 is more than 80 billion. The cost of the 7X is currently 1.1 billion dollars, or at least that was the best estimate that I could find online. I gotta tell you though, how difficult it was to find information about the 7X. So many days researching this topic and boy oh boy how difficult it was to find anything. But anyway, if we go by costs alone, even if the 7X real cost was 10 times of that, it would still be a better investment. Not only because it's cheaper, but as we will see next, it solves one of the most fundamental problems of magnetic confinement. There are mainly two problems when it comes to fusion, the heat transfer and the magnetic confinement. In a nutshell, fusion reactors are nothing more than glorified pressure pots using high-tech stuff. The concept of energy production is very similar to fission light water reactors. The main difference is that fusion releases more energy. We have complete control over the reaction, meaning if we stop feeding the machine with fuel, the reaction stops immediately. And lastly, it's not nearly as radioactive as fission. In essence, fusion can be achieved by heating atoms with 20 kiloelectron volts, and when they fuse, they release more or less 20 million electron volts. From that, you get a neutron with 14 million electron volts that leaves the plasma and it's captured by the blanket, which transfers the heat to a coolant, which can either be liquid like water or gas like helium. This is why the heat transfer is a problem. In the case of the 7X, it's one of the things that they are working on methodically to get it right in the next few years. The blanket's job is to make sure that the heat transfer happens precisely, while protecting the outer parts of the machine. Remember, we are talking about extreme temperatures separated only by a few centimeters. Graphite is a good candidate for the blanket, but the problem with it is that if it decays due to the high temperatures, it will contaminate the plasma, hindering the fusion process. The alpha particle that is emitted with 3.5 million electron volts remain in confinement to continue heating up the plasma. Now you are probably asking, so if you need only 40 kilo electron volts and you get 3.5 million electron volts, that is more than enough to get fusion going. Why don't we have fusion yet? Well, the answer is quite simple. Not all atoms fuse, which is a problem with the confinement then we must also understand that more than 80% of the heat generated is used to make electricity, while 20% keeps the plasma hot. Although you don't need much energy to initiate fusion, you do need the atoms to collide, and for that you need to increase the likelihood of collisions to happen. That is when the magnetic confinement comes into play. How a tokamak works is straightforward. You have a toroidal chamber, which is a giant circular tube or torus, with coils all around it like a solenoid. This enables the plasma to be confined in a toroidal magnetic field, so the plasma moves in a circular pattern. The problem with this approach is that the confinement is skewed towards the center of the torus due to the nature of the system, and for a tokamak to be successful, we need to even out the confinement. To do that, we introduce a second electromagnetic field using a transformer. This generates a current inside the confinement chamber making the plasma twist, which evens out the distribution and also heats it up. The system has several disadvantages, one of them being the length of the wires for the coils. Like I mentioned in my earlier video, they used 100,000 kilometers of niobium tin and or niobium titanium for that. If you want more information about this, I suggest you watch my video about fusion. Another disadvantage is the drifting of atoms due to the magnetic confinement. 
What this means is that the charged particles eventually are trapped by orbits that throws them out of the desired fusion orbit, or they drift away from the magnetic lines to which it was supposed to follow in the first place. Basically, deuterium and tritium are lost because of this, significantly decreasing the chances of fusion. To overcome this problem, they have to make the magnetic confinement stronger, which means bigger machine. Now you understand why ITER is so massive. The Wendelstein 7X offers a more elegant but complex solution to these problems. Although we all think that stellarators are something new, they are as old as tokamaks. Lyman Spitzer Jr. was the man behind the idea. What he tried to do was to find a way to eliminate the drifting of atoms in tokamaks like I explained earlier. His key insight was to understand that by twisting the shape of the plasma, it would somewhat eliminate the drifting. So he devised an experiment by turning the torus into an H-shaped tube. In his first try, he managed to heat the plasma to 500,000 Kelvin, but not much more was concluded. Keep in mind that this was during the 1950s, so achieving 500,000 Kelvin was quite a feat. His second big insight was to realize that the H shape was not necessary. What he really needed was to introduce helical field coils with currents at alternating directions throughout the length of the torus. This alone would create the desired twisted magnetical field, giving birth to the classical stellarator. Although this was a clever insight, the problem of drifting atoms is still there. It was only with the advancement of computers that the stellarators regained credibility. Supercomputers gave scientists the ability to understand how plasmas behave in extreme electromagnetic fields, and by that, they were able to design what is now the 7X. Shaping the magnetic field is crucial to any reactor, and the 7X shines because of that. It is comprised of a five-fold symmetry torus that helps shape the plasma field lines. This is important because it enables the machine to handle longer plasma times without the need of extra power. This approach is more elegant than tokamaks for a few reasons. It eliminates the necessity of a transformer to twist the magnetic field, which dramatically decreases the amount of energy required by the machine. While either will have a total magnetic field of 13 tesla, the 7x can work with only 3 to achieve the break-even state. Or so they hope. Wiring for coils are only a few hundreds of kilometers when compared to either's 100,000 kilometers. This has also an impact on time to build the machine, since getting this much wiring took almost 8 years for ITER. Stellarators can achieve stronger magnetic fields that do not require bigger machines to be obtained. Because of that, confinement is many times better than tokamaks. Stellarators can operate at steady states much better, because it has less magnetohydrodynamic activities at nearly disruption-free states. Another advantage is the steady-state magnetic fields and the absence of current-driven instabilities and disruptions, something that is an intrinsic problem with tokamaks, another reason why they have to go with bigger machines. Lastly, is cost. If it all goes well with the 7X, which is only a proof of concept, building a stellarator that can produce energy won't cost nearly as much as a project like ITER. Further optimizations such as going from a 5-fold symmetry to a quasi-symmetric 4-fold symmetry, which helps eliminate harmonics and produce a field line with single harmonic symmetry, may help achieve that, because it effectively eliminates toroidal curvature and dramatically improves particle confinement. So far, the 7X has been successful in every test, and the last upgrade for its final phase is the installment of the actively cooled diverter using CFC. This will enable the machine to handle plasmas for up to 30 minutes, and it should be ready by 2020. The future of stellarators depends on this final test, and if it all goes well, either will look really bad. Alright folks, that's it, we're done here.